Okay, we have waited the obligatory five minutes. <laughs> and so we're going to go ahead and get things started here. Um, Rose and I had a good trip to South Carolina this last week. Uh, I'm not touching anybody today because we have been traveling, so we'll do virtual handshakes, virtual hugs, that sort of stuff. Um, we've got, um, we need to take a minute and kind of refresh where we are in things uh, as we get started. Yeah, we're right here. That's right. <laughs> um, but two weeks ago, we provided an introduction to this next important section in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 through 16, which is well known as uh, the final discourse, or Jesus' farewell discourse. And so just to quickly review what we went over last time, and I just want to hit the highlights, highlights here, we provided an introduction to these three chapters. The first point that I want to re uh, help you recall is that uh, chapter 14 is somewhat set apart from chapters 15 and 16 because of the comment at the end of chapter 14 where Jesus says, now let's leave, okay? And so we talked about the different possibilities of what that might represent, and we're operating under the assumption that chapter 14, in chapter 14, John is giving us sort of an overview or a first, I'm calling it a first take, uh, as, as he sits to write this under the direction of the Holy Spirit, he um, recalls what Jesus said and did during that evening and during that discussion. He writes it once in chapter 14, but possibly sometime later he comes back and adds in chapters 15 and 16, which further amplify what he said in chapter 14. So uh, we treat chapter 14 then as the overview, chapters 15 and 16 with as more of the nitty gritty or the special illustrations that apply to the same content that we saw in chapter 14. But in addition, there's, uh, there's two important themes that we're gonna track through all of this. Uh, the first theme is that when Jesus is saying farewell to them, it isn't really farewell. And part of the message is, is that he's going to continue to be engaged with them and involved in their lives. And so that's, that's one of the major themes we're gonna be looking at. The second major theme that we'll be looking at are these wonderful little, there's five little passages in here about how Jesus is going to provide a special helper uh, to them, and we talked about that. This is the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, um, and, and we will be using that terminology. We'll be calling him either just simply the paraclete or the helper uh, because the other titles that have been given to him don't really describe the kind of work that he's doing here in John 14, 15, and 16. So that's where we were as we introduced this material. Now today we're gonna to begin to drill down in chapter 14 and take a look at it. Um, so here we go. <laughs> um, chapter 14 begins with some, some verses that we're very, very familiar with. Um, this is a message of great comfort and great reassurance for his disciples. Um, why is it, do you think, that Jesus feels the need to provide them with comfort and reassuring words at this point in time? Because he's leaving. Because he's leaving. Yeah, it's just that simple. If you take a look back at chapter 13, you see all sorts of crises and all sorts of disappointments develop. It begins when Jesus washes their feet, shows them that their kingdom that they had envisioned, they envisioned themselves sitting on thrones and ruling. Jesus says, no, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna, um, this kingdom is gonna be governed from the foot of the table, not from the, not from the head seat um, in the chief places at the table. And so that was a surprise, a shock, I'm not, and, and, and it had to fill them with some concern about what this kingdom was really going to look like. Secondly, they learned that amongst their number, somebody was going to commit treason. Somebody was going to be responsible. They knew the situation around them was dangerous. 
but somebody is going to betray Jesus and give it away. So somebody in their own number is going to do this. Um, as Jamie just mentioned a minute ago, we found out in, in verse 33 that Jesus told them flat out, I will be leaving, and where I'm going, you cannot come. Um, that had to be, you know, just like a dart hitting them. Uh, when, when he says, I'm, I'm going to be leaving you, uh, he never says he's abandoning them, but he says, I will be leaving. Um, and then he, the last thing that happened in chapter 13 was Jesus said, even Peter is going to fail. And for these guys, Peter was their leader. So if Peter can't do it, who can? And this failure was going to come that very night. He said, before the cock crows tomorrow morning, this will have all happened. And indeed, the fact is that by this time tomorrow, Jesus will be dead. That's, how, that's where we are at in this thing. So yes, they need comfort. They need reassurance uh, because of the things that are going to be happening. And in verses 1 through 3, Jesus says this thing that seems paradoxical. He said, it's going to be good for you for me to leave. <laughs> you know, this is going to be to your benefit that I'm actually leaving. And so I want us to, let's read these familiar words, but let's also recognize that most of the time when we read these words, we pull them way out of the context in which they are written and given. So let's listen to this now that we've set the context and where these disciples are at in their thinking. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Okay, verse 1, Jesus addresses the elephant in the room, how they are reacting to his leaving, their fear, their uncertainty, their insecurity. And, and, and he just simply says, don't be troubled. This is going to work out for good. The interesting thing is, is that even though there's going to be a separation, the fact that they loved him wasn't going to be expressed in terms of grief or sorrow or tears. Instead, what Jesus is anticipating is that there will actually be joy over that separation. In spite of all the horrible things that they're going to witness and experience themselves over the next 12 to 24 hours. This is going to be an awful time for them. The second half of verse 1, Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. He realizes that these events that are about to happen to him are going to bring a crisis of faith for these disciples. They can't see how his dying, they will not be able to see how his dying is to their benefit. What does that accomplish for their good? And they're not thinking theological. And so they, they're at this critical crossroad. Do they trust him enough? And Jesus says, it, it's interesting how he words this. He, he, he appeals to the fact that they believe already in God. And he says, because you believe in my Father, you can believe in me. And that's the way this should be read. It should be read something like, since you trust God, trust also in me. Okay? Jesus, we, we've seen this over and over again through the gospel. He's always deferring his place to that of God. And the, the real reason he's coming is to fix the relationship, not between himself and mankind. He's coming to fix the relationship between us and God. And so everything goes back to that. And so their faith in God is the most important thing, and their faith in, in Jesus uh, can rest on that truth. In verses 2 and 3, he now tells them why their troubled hearts don't have to be troubled. <laughs> uh, they're going to be troubled, but here's why they don't have to. And he says, essentially, he's going to heaven, to his father's house, so that's heaven. He's going to prepare for them to come later. And of course, this is now clarifying what he had said in the previous chapter to Peter when he said to Peter, remember originally in verse 33 of 13, um, Jesus said, where I'm going, you cannot come. But then in 36, he softened that a bit when he was talking to Peter and he said, you can't come now, but you will come later. 
Okay? And so that's what's happening here now in chapter 14. Jesus is saying, I'm going away, but my purpose in going away is a period of preparation because I will come again, Jesus will return, and then they will dwell together. And of course, this is referencing his second coming. Um, and, and the fact that they will be living their lives in this in-between period for most of the time uh, until, until, until this promise of Jesus is fully realized and takes place. Now, just a couple of quick text notes that are uh, important here. First of all, in, in, in verse 2, the word that's in the NIV says there are many rooms. Um, the word literally means dwelling places, places to reside. And that emphasizes two things. It emphasizes a continuing permanent relationship, okay, a place they will live together and be together forever. And secondly, it emphasizes that there's enough room there to accommodate all of them. There's capacity. Those are the, those are the two ideas that are, are born in that. It is not, as the King James trans mistranslated this, as a mansion, as an extravagant place. That's not the point. The point is being with God forever, and there will be enough capacity for that to take place. Go ahead, Lamar. It's amazing how many songs, yeah. spiritual songs, have been written with a view toward one day, no matter how you live now in heaven, you'll live in a mansion. And it's like, oh cool, yeah. I get a mansion to myself, and totally different. Yeah, this, this word has been mistranslated. The same word shows up, the same Greek word shows up in verse 23. In verse 23, Jesus replies, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Nothing about a mansion. It's about abiding together. It's about living together. And the very same Greek word is used in those two places. So this, this is not about excesses or extravagance um, or the degree of reward. It's about the fact that, that his disciples will be with him in his father's house. That's, that's what it's all about. The other thing I want for you to see before we get any farther into the chapter is take a look towards the end of the chapter at verse 27. Oh, do you have something else, yeah. Lamar? Go ahead. One thing's troubling me about what he said when he said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Why is it what he was saying that was, would be so unbelievable to them? Because it seemed like they did believe in him. They just didn't understand yeah. what he was saying. Yeah. There's a lot of ways in which the, the syntax of the Greek language, the way the words flow together, doesn't translate accurately to English no matter what you do. And when he, when he says this phrase, you believe in God, believe also in me, that doesn't mean they don't believe in him. It just means that faith needs to rest on the fact that they trust God the Father. Go ahead, Jamie. It's this very thing that he's sharing with them. He knows they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to, but, but he's encouraging them again, and then they will remember. That's right. That's what he said. This whole thing is a message of encouragement. It's not a message of theology. It's a message of Here's where you are. There's going to be crises. There's going to be challenges. But here's how you can overcome that. And, and, and you'll do okay. That's, this next section is going to be a big pat on the back. And we, we'll look at it that way. Yeah. That's right. He's, he's given them the whole, the whole mission, uh, the, all the plans behind the mission, not just the top layer anymore. This is the whole thing. It's kind of like, uh, you know, we walk into a store and we see how they do their business. This is like reading the business plan. This is, you know, where this idea came from and all these different things. Well, this is, this is everything that stands behind that business. This is, this is everything that stands behind his mission. And that's what he's trying to convince them of. He doesn't even give them details about what the mission will turn into. We'll talk about that more later. But he doesn't, you know, there's no word in here about the life of the church. And that's what these guys are going to be responsible for. Jesus teaches them zippo about how to, how to lead a church. Okay? 
And, and yet that is going to be their main responsibility. But he knows that if he can solve the faith problem, and if he provides them with that other helper, then it'll work out. Everything will be okay. His game plan is working its way forward. It's, it's, it's going to work out. Okay, so just to put this whole chapter into a loop, I want you to notice now this, this uh, similarity between verse 1 and verse 27. Remember, verse 1 said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. Now look at verse 27. Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give you to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. That, he bookends this chapter with those two statements and that's what this is all about. Don't be afraid. This is a message of comfort and great encouragement for them. Um, okay, so the summation of verses 1 through 3. Jesus has now revealed his master plan. Um, and, and the plan is for them ultimately to be together. Their separation will not be permanent. And in reality, Jesus is going to leave them not once, but twice. First, he's going to leave in the next 24 hours when he dies. They will be confused, they will be lost, and in spite of what he has encouraged them with here, their hearts will be troubled. <laughs> they, and, and, and we would be too. But then, when the reality of his resurrection dawns, everything will fall into place. And their trust from that point forward will be unshakable. So when Jesus leaves the second time, when he goes back to heaven, when he ascends after 50 days, they will now have all the assurance that their heart needs. They don't have to be troubled. They understand much, much more. They will carry on his mission, and now they will live, as we just mentioned a few minutes ago, in this in-between status for the rest of their earthly lives. They will live waiting for Jesus to fulfill his promise in verses 2 and 3 that he's going to prepare a place for them and he will be back to take them with him. Uh, what an incredible anchor to hold on to for the rest of their lives, okay? All right, next, we get to this section in verses four through 11. And this is clearly a message of encouragement Jesus turns to address their lives and their needs and what life will be like for them after he ascends and returns back to his Father. This section is not, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, this section is not theology. This section is a peptum. This section is a coach getting his team ready to play with confidence and go out on the field and, and win the day. That's what this section is all about. He wants to reassure them, and he tells them, you know more than you even realize. You believe more than you even realize. Remember previously in another gospel, he talked about having grains of mustard seed faith. Well, that's their faith is enough. That's the message to them. So he tells them here in these verses, 4 through 11, you already know the way you know the way where we're going in this thing. But they think they're talking about a location, the destination. But instead, he's telling them how they get there. Um, he's not focusing so much on the geography as he is the means of getting there, the how. And if they know how to get there, it doesn't matter where they're going. If they know how to get there, they'll end up in the right place. So Jesus doesn't have to tell them, uh, you know, you, you go this direction, take a left at the light, and then, and then, you know, go to the end of the traffic circle, and it'll be a third house on the right. He doesn't have to tell them that. He says, plug in your GPS and use that. It'll get you there. And this, this is a GPS that really will work, too. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's read 4 through 11. As we read this now, listen for these two things. Watch for him, to, how he encourages them. And secondly, notice that he's giving them the mechanism on how they'll get there rather than a road map. Okay, 4 through 11. You know the way to the place where I'm going. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? He's looking at geography. And Jesus answered, 
I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. And from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus said, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it's the Father living in me who's doing his work. Believe me when I say that I'm in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. This is Jesus' pep talk. You're farther along in this than you think, guys. You've got the tools that you need already. So, verse 4. <clears throat> Jesus tells them they already know their way. To where? Well, back to verses 2 and 3. To heaven. They know their way to the Father's house. Where they're, where they're ultimately going and where Jesus is going. And he's providing them this reassurance that they know the way. And all they need to do is believe and trust that information. It will work out. Verse 5, Thomas, once again, the realist in the group, he's still questioning. He wants a road map. And he speaks for the entire group with this question. And Jesus answers in verse 6 with what has been called, oops, yeah, with what has been called the core statement of this entire gospel. This one right here, 14.6. This is another of Jesus' I am statements, but this one brings all of the others under its umbrella, okay? When you think about Jesus being the bread of life, that's part of his being the way, the way to God. When you think of him being the light of the world, that's what makes him the way to God. When you think of him being the gate, that's the way into the sheepfold, the good shepherd, taking care of those, that, and, and being sure they arrive at their destination. The, the resurrection and the life, that he is the way no matter what happens in your life. And so all of these other things, and, and he's going to talk in chapter 15 about being the true vine. And in that sense, he is the only way to be connected to the Father. So the, this, this statement sort of summarizes all of the others. They all fall underneath this one. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, again, if you look at the context and, and, and the syntax of, of the original language, it might be better to have this written, I am the way to the Father, in that I am the truth and the life. There are three key words, way, truth, and life. All right, Jesus claims to be all three. But in the syntax of the language, being the way, it rests upon him being the truth and the life. Okay? So those are the two fundamental pillars that allow him to function as, as the way. So let's take a look at this in that order. First of all, he says he is the truth. What does that mean? Well, it means he's totally reliable. Because he has demonstrated accurately and completely who his father is and what his father is like. He is absolutely truthful about who his father is. And that is one of those pillars upon which everything rests. This should remind us, we've, we've been hearing this through the whole gospel. You go all the way back to the beginning in chapter 1, the prologue in verse 14, it says, Jesus came from the Father full of grace and full of truth. He's, he goes on three verses later in verse 17 to say that um, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So this is not a foreign concept. Jesus has been, John has been laying the groundwork for this all along. So that's, that's the notion of Jesus being, oh, I didn't mean to do that. I thought I could. I thought I could use the pointer on this thing. I was going to try something new. <laughs> there we go. The word truth. Okay. All right. Now let's take a look. Oh man. Oh, Learn not to do that anymore. 
There. All right, we'll go to life. In, how is Jesus the life? What in the world does that mean? Well, two thoughts. First of all, Jesus holds the power of life. He, he was there, according to the prologue again, he was there in the beginning when everything that was made that has been made. And he was engaged in that process. Remember how he was able to resurrect Lazarus. He has that power within him to bring life. But in addition to that, not not just his power and his control over life, but also his desire for life. The fact that Jesus wants to bring life. He, he is the source of life in our world. He doesn't want death and decay. He wants life. John 3, 16 and 17. God uh, so loved the world. He sent his son. Whoever believes in him might have, uh, have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might have life. Yes. And what about John 10.10 10, when he says, um, Jesus, I, I came that they may have life abundantly and have it abundantly. That's right. His whole mission was about bringing life instead of death and decay. So that, those are the two principles that set up for Jesus to also then function as the legitimate, the only real way to get to God. The only way that we can get there is by trusting the one who is truthful about God and the one who has the power of life and the desire for life. He is the force, he is the life force of the world. Okay? And that is what, what Jesus is all about. That's what allows him to say to, to Martha, in chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. So now, um, Jesus brings spiritual life to the world that he had thousands of years earlier given physical life to. How about that? Um, notice before we leave this verse, notice that all of these words are singular. There are not multiple ways there are not multiple truths about God. There are not multiple life forces. No, there's just one. And that's because Jesus is the only one who can qualify. He is the only one who can qualify. Any other path that you would choose to be your way to God is either not truthful or it's not bringing life. That's, that's the bottom line. Verse 7. Verse 7 has two halves, and they almost sound like they're in contradiction with each other. Look at them. Verse 7. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. If you really knew me. But then he goes on to say, from now on you do know him and have seen him. Well, does that mean they're getting a magical insight right this, this very second? No. It's another one of those moments when the language doesn't give us what it's, what it's really saying. A better translation of the first part of the book, of the first part of the verse would be something like, if you have known me, and you have, you will know my Father also. Or, because you have known me, you will know my Father also. So it's because of the fact that they have known Jesus that they will also know their Father. Okay? And that is what this is saying. This is not calling into question their allegiance to him, or their knowledge of him, or their belief in him. The, the condition for knowing God is knowing Jesus, okay? And once more, Jesus is providing them with reassurance, with help for their troubled hearts. He says, from this point on, from this moment forward, you do know him and you have seen him. You hear the, 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 the confidence that's in those words and what he's trying to share with them? The gumption he's trying to create in them so that they'll be able to withstand what's coming, but then also to live from this day forward. Well, in verse 8, it's Philip's turn to ask the question on everybody's mind. And this time, his question is, he, he, he's got some doubts about whether he has really seen the Father. And once more, he is also thinking literally as if God could be seen or visualized. Um, you know, we, we, we haven't seen anything quite like Sinai. Well, they did see the Mount of Transfiguration, didn't they? But, you know, where, where was God in that? Phil, Phil, Philip's not so sure. And in verses 9 through 11, Jesus kind of holds him accountable for that. And he says, 
how long have you been watching, Philip? <laughs> what do you think you've been seeing? What do you think you've been experiencing? And Jesus essentially takes his answer from verse 6, and now he enlarges it. He says, basically, you see the Father in me. You see the Father right here, right in your evidence. And he gives two specific evidences. And this is in verse, verse 10. The two evidences are his words, which are the Father's words, and his works, which are the Father's works. And that would include, it's not limited to, but it would include all of the special miracles that Jesus has performed along the way. But also the routine things that Jesus would do in daily life. So these two evidences should be telling them, and are, that, that they are witnessing God come in the flesh. And what a privilege they had experienced for the past three, and four, three or four years. They had been hearing the words, the teachings of Jesus, They'd also been seeing the actions and the miracles and the attitudes of Jesus. And you put those two things together and they've been watching God in the flesh, the Father. Where have you been, Philip? What have you been seeing? What have you been noticing? That's a question that indicts us too, isn't it? What have you been seeing? What have you been looking at? Have you really been looking for, for God? in your life because if you look he's there you know he's right there the next section verses 12 through 24 and we'll get started into this we won't finish all of this today but we'll get started into it the, this section divides into three pieces the entire section is talking about what I'm calling the new order. What I mean by that is the way things are going to be once Jesus has gone. Okay? What's, what's life going to be like without Jesus? All right? And he's going to get down to some nitty gritty ideas and thoughts and, 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 and promises here. It divides into three sections. The first piece is that Jesus' work will continue. Then we're going to see that there will be a special helper, the Holy Spirit, who will be engaged in this process. And then the fellowship, the relationship between Jesus and his disciples is not terminated. It will continue, okay? And it will continue in some special ways. I have to be honest with you, this, this particularly this third, third section is very difficult to understand in our Western minds because we want to lay things out and and have a specific order and we want to have nice job descriptions for everybody it doesn't fit into that it just doesn't fit and and this is this is something that I've been working on for not weeks months trying to trying to figure out what's going on in some of this some of this stuff and I'm going to present you with my my status report <laughs> I'm not saying this is what I will necessarily think two weeks from now, two months from now, certainly not two years from now or two decades from now. Um, but, but we're going to do our best to fight our way through this because there is some really, really rich stuff in here. And, and again, I mentioned this two weeks ago when we were talking. As we go through this stuff, and particularly we look at the roles of the Holy Spirit, it's very challenging for us to think about, well, this is... Jesus is specifically talking with, with his apostles, with his disciples, with his 11. But how much of this spills over for our benefit too? How much of this is written for us? And that's, that's, there's a lot of legitimate questions in that, but I think you'll see that we have the need for the Holy Spirit to function in many of the same ways that these disciples had, just because we do not either enjoy the physical presence of Jesus here on earth. And we can't simply go to him and talk and, and ask the question that's on our heart. So, you know, those answers have to be provided in some other formats. And I, I believe that the Holy Spirit is engaged in, in us as well and providing the reassurance that, that we need, okay, as well as the growth and the information and the, the roadmap. I mean, all the, all the things that are necessary to walk the Christian life. Okay. Um, we're going to start, and we'll hopefully get through the first one of these three 
bullet points. That is, uh, we start out reading about the fact that Jesus' work is going to continue and that his, uh, his mission will progress even though he is no longer here. So let's read 12 through 15. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. If you love me, you will obey what I command. Verse 12 connects what Jesus had already done with what he will continue to do through their work, the work that they will continue in his place. Jesus begins with the statement, I tell you the truth, or in the older translations it might say truly, truly, or verily, verily. This tells us that this is an important, serious moment. What Jesus is going to tell them is, is important, or he wouldn't waste the time with those words. Those words say, okay, you need, to, you need to get this one. You need to listen. And, and what he says in the first part of verse 12 is that what I have, he talks about what I have been doing, and that includes the miracles that he was just talking about back in verse 11, okay, when he said, at least believe on the evidence of the miracles. And then he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do these same things. And then he goes on to say, he will do even greater things than these. Well, what are those greater things? <laughs> well, it's certainly not that their activities will surpass what he has done. He created the world. He brought life back to a dead man. He calmed the storms. He fed 5,000. They're going to do some special things, but they're not going to be bigger or greater or more powerful. So in what sense can Jesus say this? Well, what he's talking about is the fact that the net collective effect of their efforts will change the entire world. When you look at it, Jesus has changed the life of a lot of individuals, and especially these 11. But now this message is going to go forth, and the greater things that they will do is they will propagate the gospel everywhere now. And their collective work will be greater than that which Jesus could do as a single man. There will be more. There will be the 11 who will go forth from that place. But then there will be the thousands who are converted. There will be those who, who carry the gospel to the entire world. There will be 2,000 years later a handful of Christians in Port Huron, Michigan. Right? And we will be part of doing that greater stuff. The net effect will be greater. Um, I wrote down that it, the apostles will show this through their teaching and their powerful demonstrations in the Acts of the Apostles. We will see individual Christians within the church having tremendous collective power and influence upon the world. And then this will all be taking place under the guidance and direction of God's Holy Spirit. He will be taken care of. And this will in turn bring greater collective glory to God than what was able to be done in the first in, in, in the first demonstration. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Greater things will be done. It's not emphasizing on you will do a miracle that surpasses what I've done. That's, that's not what it's about. It's all about the net effect. And the net effect will be because there will be tens and hundreds and thousands now carrying that work out to the rest of the world and, they, and through all of history and that's what it's that's what this is all about um, <clears throat> in verses 13 and 14 <clears throat> Jesus tells him that in this new order the way things are going to be in the future he will still be connected to them and their connection will be through prayer. In 12b, 
he says, remember, notice carefully in 12b, he will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. These greater works are going to occur after Jesus returns to his Father. And that represents the fact that when Jesus has returned to his Father, he will now be able to respond to, in, uh, to our prayers no matter where. Because Jesus is no longer a physical being, he's now a spiritual being. And so he will be able to respond to, to prayer wherever he's at. He speaks of saying things uh, in my name, making requests in my name in both verses 13 and 14. And I, I, I think this is an interesting one. It brings me back to a time when somebody came up to me and asked me, well, I don't think that prayer that we said last Sunday was legitimate because they just said amen. They didn't say in Jesus' name. Well, the question is, is it so much whether you say you do it in Jesus' name or are you praying in Jesus' name? And what does that mean? Well, it means, first of all, that you're pay, praying under Jesus' authority. Right. You're recognizing his place in, in hearing and responding to what you have just asked. That's praying in Jesus' name. It's not about the fact whether you remember to say it or not. That's not what it is. It's, it's saying that Jesus is the reason that I can offer this prayer, whether I'm speaking to the Holy Spirit, whether I'm speaking to God, whether I'm speaking to Jesus himself. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not about saying you pray in Jesus' name. It's about praying in Jesus' name by, Je by who Jesus is. Okay, all right. Well, maybe we've all done that once in a while. Um, two important meanings come up in this idea of praying in Jesus' name. First of all, it's the idea of appealing to Jesus through uh, his authority, okay, and his availability to us. But then also, praying in his name means those things have to be consistent with who he is and what he wants, what his will is so that they fit into his authority. He's not going to do something that doesn't fit his, his charge, his mission, his responsibility. So praying in his name means you're recognizing his authority, his direction of the mission, and those things that will please him. That's praying. It's, it's, the, it's the very same thing as saying, um, thy will be done. It's the very same thing in that regard. The last thing, or not the last thing, but next to the last thing that I want to mention is in verses uh, 13 and 14, it says, uh, I will do whatever you ask. And then in verse 14, you may ask me for anything. But again, this is not carte blanche. This is not a blank check to, okay, I, I want the Mercedes or, you know, whatever it is that, that, that I want. It's qualified by, number th verse 13 says, it's got to be something that's going to bring glory to the Father. Okay? How does this request bring glory to the Father? Verses 13 and 14, we've already talked about it. He speaks of praying in his name. Something that, is this consistent with his will? Is this consistent with his desire? Is this something that will therefore fall under his authority and his direction? Yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, they just handle it like we talked about first. It's, it's everything. <laughs> it's everything. Um, and then the third reason is because of verse 15. My Bible has a break between 14 and 15, but if you take that break out, you'll see that the other condition for um, asking for things in, in Jesus' name is obedience because that's the proof of our love to Jesus. And so 15 connects directly with 13 and 14, all right? But again, in verse 15, something gets lost in translation. You'll see, and it's the same phrase that's coming up over and over and over again. It's this phrase, if you this, then this. It, and it, it throws doubt in the way that, that we think of these disciples. And Jesus isn't trying to create doubt. Jesus is just simply saying, since this is true, this is true, okay? So... A better translation, instead of saying, if you love me, you will obey what I command, a better translation would be something like, if you love me, as I know you do, you will obey. Or because you love me, you will obey. 
That's what, the, that's what the verse is really saying. And so Jesus makes his appeal for obedience on the basis of their love for him. He goes back to the fact that they love him and love what they have been doing together for the past three or four years. What is he asking for in verse 15? Well, they have to continue to obey his commands, even when he's gone. Remember, that's what we're talking about here, is what's life gonna be like when he's gone? Well, even though he's gone, he still has marching orders, okay? And those are the actions that he talked about back in verse 12, when he said, he will do what I've been doing, and in that way, they will be continuing Jesus' mission. They will do what I have been doing. It's just simply a continuation of things. So, how will life be in the new setup? This first section here tells us that Jesus' work will progress and continue. Jesus is not abandoning them by his departure. I think, yeah, there we go. I thought I had one more. Um, Jesus is not abandoning them by his departure because he is now a heavenly being, or he will become a heavenly being, he will be able to respond to them globally and throughout all of time. He will be able to provide everything they need for all of their work. And the linkage between earth and heaven, the linkage from earth to heaven, will be that of prayer. That will be the foundation upon which those left behind can continue to continue their relationship with, with the heavenly uh, son. Next, we are going to move into the opposite direction. How will heaven's information get to earth? And that's where we will talk about next week how the Holy Spirit will help. Okay? So this will balance the scales as, and, and show us how that continuing how that relationship can continue. Okay? Jamie? That's how you can get to where, you know, I'm not going to say Philip was doing this, but when Philip asked his question about seeing the Father, I made the point that, you know, are we seeing the spiritual in our lives? That's, that's the recognition that we live in a spiritual world, and, and the recognition that that is where the important stuff's really happening. Um, it's, it's not in this world. Jesus is going to take us right into the, that spiritual word, world at the end of the chapter when he talks about Satan's on the doorstep right now, and he's going to say that to them. And, and he's going to say, he has no hold on me, but I'm doing this because it's what the Father desires. And it's what the Father wants. He's going to remind us of that spiritual dimension of what is about to happen. And that's the dimension that we need to be living in. Okay? All right. God is good.